Isn't that a great groove? That is what you do. You keep on coming through. That is what you do. You keep on coming through. That is what you do. You keep on coming through. Come on, you got to be singing that. That is what you do. You keep on coming through. Come on, when you're going through hell, that is what you do. You keep on coming through while you're at work. That is what you do. What are you singing? You keep on coming through. I got a groove. That is what you do. You keep on coming through. That is what you do. You keep on coming through. I know they're talking about you. But that's what you do. You keep on coming through. I know they gave you a bad report. The doctor. That is what you do. You keep on coming through. The pressure's trying to visit you. What you do. You keep on coming. Got some bad news. That is what you do. You keep on coming through. I love it. How many feel that? This is what's going to happen to you. After we just did that, this is what's going to happen. You're going to wake up in the morning, and that song's going to be on your mind. You're like, where did that song come from? That is what you do. You're going to wake up in the right groove. Come on. You're going to wake, wake up with the right comfort. How many believe that's got, got shifting your groove right now? I love it. I love it. And that is true. What is it? That's what God does. He always comes through. He's so faithful. He's 100% always loves you. 100% will always show up. And if you ask him, he'll help you. And what he did then, he'll do right now for you. There's hope for you. Let's give one more praise to the Lord. He's such a good, good God. I am. Thank you for everyone online being here and everyone that's here. And I believe this. Everybody, this, everybody, believe, I believe this. Everybody should have a church home. I, I believe that everybody should have a home. That means there's homeless people on the streets, and I believe that they shouldn't remain on the streets. I believe the church should do something about it, and we are. Um, I, what's so great about this church that if there's someone hurting and they're broken, we got an answer. I talked to a young lady, and and her and and her name she might be watching right now, and and her and, her, and I don't know if her boyfriend or something they ran out of gas right in front of my house. How crazy is that? Like, you run out of gas anywhere but in front of my house. So she, she comes knocking on my door, and I'm like, she goes, Ken, I ran out of gas. I don't know if it was a hustle or what. So I just went to their car, and, and they had a little gas tank, and she goes, we just don't have any gas. We we're, we're trying to sell this lawnmower. I don't know where they got the lawnmower from, but <laughs> I'm not asking questions. I'm not, I'm not the popo. I'm just trying to go along with this. <laughs> so she said... <laughs> She said, okay, we'll get into that other story. So, okay. So, I go, I'll go get gas. So, I went and I went by myself, got gas, and, and then I, I poured the gas. I mean, I helped them pour the gas. And, and I began to talk to her boyfriend or friend about the Lord. And he was resisting me the whole time, just resisting me, resisting me, resisting me. And I'm thinking, man, whatever I'm saying is not working. Like, he is not listening. And then China comes out of the car. She goes, you're acting like a fool right now. You need to shut your mouth and listen. And I go, girl, I want to say that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know what's crazy? That we try to act like know-it-alls and we're running out of gas. I mean, I'm not saying there's no wrong running run out of gas, but your life's a mess and you're still not listening. He should have said, I, you probably know better because you got me gas. But it was so cool because China, what she did, she gave me her number. And she goes, um, I hear you. And I don't believe this is a coincidence. My mom been praying for me. And what are the chances of me running out of gas in front of your car? And I go, China, I go, God wants to restore your life, baby. And I thought I was talking to him, but I was talking to you the whole time. I go, that's how much God loves you, China. And I said, China, this is what we're going to do together. I don't believe this is a coincidence. Do you? She goes, no, I don't think so at all. She gave me her number. It's the right number because I called her the other day. And, and I told her, China, I want to get you off the streets. And we got a women's home for you. And I want to, God wants, I go, do you have any kids? She goes, yes, I do. I go, God wants you to get in a position to be the mama you've always wanted to be. And I know you love them. 
but it's time to get restored so you could be the mama you've always wanted to be. And, and I go, once we get you restored, China, once we get you restored, we got a second level and a second stage. We got a women's and children's home where you're going to be able to be with your children, not worry about bills or anything, just restore, just love and relationship with your kids. And then we're going to help you get a job and we're going to help you overcome and you'll never be in the same place again. And you know what China said? She goes, that's exactly what I need. So this week, I'm going to call China. She's going to come in for an interview, God willing, and we're going to get her off the streets. All we're saying, a church, come on, should meet needs in the community. And that's what we're doing as a church every day. But San Bernardino needs it, but so does Pomona, and so does Kenya, and so does Uganda, and so does your family, and so do your kids, and so does your crazy husband and your crazy wife, whatever. How many know we all have some crazy situations? Some of you guys are wondering, why am I, why was I born just like with this crazy family? Because you're crazy too. No, just kidding. <laughs> but how many know that God will use you to reach them too? No one, everybody grows up in a dysfunctional family. That's my story too. How many know that? Like, we're crazy. But God's an answer. Jesus is an answer. I'm so glad you're here. This place right here is a place where God's presence is encountered. Miracles happen in this room right now. So there's nothing impossible right now. Nothing's impossible right now. God could give you an idea for a breakthrough in your business right now. Boom, down. Um, God could turn your cancer report into a heal report now. God could take your depression away and give you joy now. God could take your sleepless nights and give you peace and tranquility right now. God could restore, come on, your marriage. Come on, get your kids off the streets and bring them back home where they're supposed to be. Come on, right now. There's some, this could happen now. A suicidal spirit. You've been thinking about dying and giving up. And God says, I'll set you free from that spirit right now. I'm, come on, God, salvation is now. And you know what my responsibility is? I just want to build your faith. To start believing again. Because it, nothing is impossible with God. And I'll say this. Nothing is impossible for those who believe. Your greatest enemy is your own doubt. How many know it's good to be in a room like this to start building some faith? God's ready to do something great. You got to build the faith. You got to hear it. Father, we just thank you. So it's time to study your word and. Help us to understand it, apply it, be part of it. We're really believing right now. There's a lot of crazy things happening in this world. We can't complain about it. We got to be the answer for it. That's where your church comes in. The only group in the world that could bring salvation and healing and eternal life and new life is the church. So I thank you, Lord, we're here. And we're not going to let this city be lost. Our families be lost. Those little orphans in Kenya, we're not going to let them be orphans again. We're going to love them. We're going to hug them. We're going to take care of them. We're going to go into the streets and let the homeless know. We'll get, you could be off the streets today. we got a men's home. Today's your day. Of course, some of them don't accept the offer, but, Father, we can make the offer. So we just thank you, Lord for allowing us to be a team to make, that makes your dream on earth come to pass. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. You guys are awesome. And for the next few moments, I, I want to talk to you about a really important subject. And we're going to talk about the subject of the church. And, and there, there's people who have all kinds of opinions about the church. Some people think it's a, like a religious institution and I want nothing to do with the church or they, they say something like this, oh, that's man-made. And, and we're going to find out if that's really true. Is, is a church a man-made institution? Was it created by man? Or was it an idea of God? And what we're going to do is not look at our opinions. We're going to go to the Word of God. And we're going to show you where the church started and who was the author of it, who it belongs to, and who empowers it to do what it's been called to do. Let's look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And this is Jesus speaking. Who is speaking? Jesus. And he's talking about this subject of the church. And he says this, you are Peter. He's talking to Peter. And I, I, and I can guarantee 
that on this rock I will build my church. Now, the rock that he said he would build his church on, it means this, is, is the word or truth. He goes, I, I would build my whole church on un people understanding the words that I speak. Now, you are living your life. And there's a, you either have a, a strong foundation, fa strong morals. They're there, a foundation, because your life was built on something that's true. You don't have a strong foundation if your life is built on lies. The Bible, Jesus said this, he or she who hears my words and, and does them or follows them is a wise person that builds his house or builds his house or home on the rock. Builds it on a what? But those that actually hear the word and they don't listen to it and they don't obey it and they continue doing it their way, they build their house and they build their lives and they build their families on sand. So when the wind comes and the storms of life come, because the foundation is not on the rock, it all falls apart. Some of you guys are moving towards a calamity because your foundation is sand. There's no substance to it. You're building your life on your personal ideas, your personal opinions, and you're doing it your way. And you got the free will to build your life however you want it. But understand, when the pressure hits, it's all going to fall apart. You're going to lose a family. You're going to lose your health. You're going to lose your life. You're going to lose yourself. You're going to lose your integrity. You're going to lose your honor. You're going to lose your kids. It's going to happen. Not because it was God's will. It's because you built your life on the wrong foundation. But those that build their lives on the word of God. See, you don't have to be real intelligent, have an high IQ. You just have to be able to hear instructions receive them and do it because success comes with instructions and if you just follow the instructions it and God's instructions I guarantee you this it's going to lead you to an amazing life see I'm not very smart I'm just really obedient God says and I go yes sir let's do it because he always has the best intentions for me and he has the best intentions for you so he said I'm going to build this whole church on the rock on the word on truth. And this is what he says. I'll, I'll, build, I'll, build my, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not overpower it. So let's break this scripture down. Number one, what does Jesus say about the church? Jesus said that he would build the church. So who built the church? It wasn't man that built the church. It wasn't a man idea. It was a God idea. And not only did man not build it, man is not building it right now. God is still building his church. He's building his church, and of course, he uses his people to build his church. God is continually building his church, and he's using us, of course, to build his church. How God builds his church now is through us. He's still building his church. It's his church. Some of the churches right now that we're, um, that we're opening or launching, um, they're really important because God wants his churches open, and he wants them to be places of hope, and he wants there to be a place where someone like China could come and experience love and, and take the burden off of her so she could experience freedom and a new life. Now, we know there's a war to close down churches. I looked at a stat the other day, and it said this. The average church attendance in America is 65 people. In the last 20 years, attendance in America has dropped by 50%. But it's, so, it's, it's not a coincidence that not only attendance has dropped 50%, mass shootings have raised thousands of percent. Depression is the number one cause right now of, of, of disability right now in the world. The less we have of God, the more dysfunction we have. Our relationships aren't working anymore. We're struggling there. We're losing our sense of identity. We're losing our sense of direction. We're more divided than we ever have been. There seems to be more hate in this world than ever. What's going on? We no longer are prioritizing God 
People no longer are under the instructions of God. And you know what that means? Our schools are being built on the sand. Our government's being built on the sand. Our families are being built on the sand. Our relationships are being built on the sand. And then we wonder why they're all falling apart. And God is saying, come back to my... God, come on, God doesn't change his standards because society is changing their standards. What is true is true today. It's true, come on, it's true yesterday. It's going to be true in the future. And God is saying there's one thing that you can guarantee. If you build your house on the rock, it's going to stand. It's very simple. So I'm here to learn the word, and I'm here to apply the word, and then some teach some people the word. So some of the churches that we're going to be opening, some of them are right now closed. And what we're going to do is reopen them, or they'll get repurposed. It's a very interesting thing. I was looking, um, uh, uh, there's a lot of, in Europe, there's been almost a death of the church in a sense. Um, there's been a lot of churches that they built, beautiful cathedrals that have been shut down right now. And this is what's happened to them. They've been repurposed. Let me show you a picture real quick of a church in Europe right now. That used to be a church, but now it's a bar and a nightclub. That section in the middle are the bartenders serving all these people. There used to be a place there where people used to come and receive communion, receive Jesus, get messages of hope. But this is what happened. The church died. They no longer were busy building their house on the rock and teaching the word and transferring and passing on their faith to the next generation. Somehow the church died and the people in the church became religious and they lost their love and they lost their purpose. They lost their fire to help somebody else out. They lost their belief in God and, and saying goes, perfect, I'll repurpose it. We cannot allow that to happen in America. We need to open churches. We need to open more churches. Because if we don't open it up, that every city that doesn't have a church is a city without hope. Is a city that the enemy is taking over. And he takes over families. And he takes over neighborhoods. And he takes over lives. He takes over minds. It's a real war. The church that we're purchasing in Pomona, the enemy had a plan to repurpose it. Let me tell you the story of that church. It was built in, 19, in 1888. Say it with me, 1888. 134 years ago. A Methodist church came in. The city of Pomona was established in 1888. And they said, we want this city to have a church in the city because we're believing the city's going to grow. But part of the healthy growth is that we have a church in the city that's dependent on God so we can have an opportunity for the city to depend on God so it could be a prosperous city. And they, they gave everything. That, they built all of this the way it is. I want you to get this. In 1888, this beautiful church, they were thinking the best for God. That building has beautiful stained glass. And I'm sure someone could have said, we don't need the stained glass. It's just kind of, let's, let's cut the cost down. And I'm sure someone else said, no. Isn't this for God? Shouldn't it, be the most, shouldn't it be the most beautiful building in the city? Shouldn't it be attractive? Shouldn't it be a community center where all the city officials, they come here and they have their meetings here and they include God in their decision making? That's how it used to be. The schools used to be the school. I mean, the churches used to be the schools. They used to be the center of the community. So they built that church. Over the years, that church has the congregations died, and of course, no one's alive that built that church. And recently, in 2014, they just put, 2014, they put padlocks on the doors, and they shut the church down. There's a Chinese congregation that bought the church in 2017, and they said, we want that church reopened. And they had a real small congregation, but they invested almost a million dollars to refurbish the building. During COVID, the church shut down, and they never reopened the church again. So in December of 2022, which just was some months ago, they put the church back up for sale. Now, the vision of that church, the purpose of that church is at stake. 
either we're going to let a church be shut down and repurpose, or we're going to do everything we can to open up that church and reach a city because the church has the power to save souls. The church has the power to give hope. The church has the power to feed the hungry. The church has the power to help people get off the streets. The church has the power, come on, to, to, to heal the broken heart. It has the power to do it. So this is what happened. As soon as they put the building on, they got a full offer. They asked $3.4 million, and they got $3.4 million cash. And this is, the one, this is what it was. It was a, a group of investors that wanted the church to church, turn the church into a place where they have wine testing and cigar smoking. It's a beautiful artistic building. And they were saying this would be perfect for a place, wine testing place, cigar smoking place. And when I found that out, this is what I said. I'm not going to compete on price because if the owner of this building doesn't want it to be a church, we want nothing to do with it. We got to see the DNA of this. So what I did was I set up a meeting with the owner in L.A. And we drove down there. It was an hour and a half drive. We drove down there. I met up with him in the room and, and, I, and I asked him, Pastor, are you just looking to get the most price for this building or do you want it to be a church? And I was waiting for his answer. And he goes, I want it to be a church. I go, so if you want it to be a church, I told him, we're the church. So we went into five months of negotiations. And we ended up getting the building for a million dollars off at 2.3. Come on, that's the price of a house in the upper hills of Pomona. Give God some praise. Come on, this is a really good deal. But I want you to get this. We're going to reach a lot of people. And this is what we're doing. He said, I built my church. And this is the second thing that Jesus said. The church belongs to me. It's my church. You know what's so awesome about God saying it's my church? And what is the church? First of all, the church is all of us believers. The church are his people. It's all the believers on earth. And it's all the believers that have ever lived. That's the church. We're the church. The church is not just a building. The church is the people in the building because a building without the people is just a building. But a building with people that love God is a powerful place where people can come and experience the hope, experience the power, experience the freedom of Jesus. So the church is, is every believer. But don't mistake this. The church is a building where God's people come together and they worship and they sing and they're taught. And together we exercise our faith. We build each other up. And this is what happens when we come together in Jesus' name. He's there. He said, wherever two believers get together, I'm there. We got more than two believers. I don't know how many, we probably have 2,000 people in this room right now. And they're here. And I'm telling you here, Jesus is here right now. You might be saying, I would have loved to walk with Jesus back in the day. He goes, I'm the same Jesus right now. My spirit is here. And whatever you need from me, ask in my name and I'll give it to you. Now, when God says that the church belongs to him, do you know what he's saying is? You belong to him. Now, you know what's so awesome about you belonging to him? That means it's his responsibility to take care of you. I love it. So the church is believers. It's a body of believers. The church is a building as well. And the church, another name for the church is the body of Jesus. Say it with me. The body of what? Jesus. There's a scripture I want to uh, read you. It says it says right here in Colossians 1:18. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. Uh, so what does that mean? This is what it means. If G- when Jesus wants to heal someone, he uses his body to do it. You know who's the body? We're the body. Now he does it through his body. So that means there's someone sick. You lay hands on them, and they get healed. Robert, the other day at, at the Arizona campus, there was a lady that had cancer, and she came to the service for the first time. He prayed with her. She was healed of her cancer. She went to the doctor, got a report, and they said, what happened to you? Jesus was healing her through his body. Do you know, Jesus is still setting people free. We had 
This is what we, it's, it's super cool. Jesus is still doing ministry. Jesus is still walking the streets. Yeah, um, yesterday in Venice Beach. Let's see if we got that in Venice Beach. Where's where that Venice Beach um, video real quick? Okay. This is the Way Rural Outreach LA in Venice Beach. And this is what happens. We're there praying for people. Jesus is still praying for people. By the time we were all said and done, we were baptizing people that were getting saved in Venice Beach because Jesus is still baptizing people. Come on, Jesus is still preaching. Jesus, come on, Jesus is still singing. Jesus, come on, Jesus is still touching people, loving them, and hugging them right here in Venice Beach. Look at that. That was a God invasion. We're crazy. Right? How, how many have ever gone to Venice Beach? It's pretty wild. Yeah, they went in there, and the first thing, look at that, people getting baptized. They just got saved. Look at that. Let's give God some praise. Come on, Jesus is still doing the work through his body. When, when they got there, Jesus is still playing basketball. Uh, when they got there, a, a Satanist actually came right away. And he said to them, this is my territory. Get out of here. And then we just love and say, no, we're here to invade. We're here to take over. Just keep back and relax. Listen to what God is doing. And we just stayed right there. By the time we we're done, people were getting saved. Prophetic words were being given. And we were beating everybody in basketball. You know, it was so cool because in, in Venice Beach, all the hoopers and basketball players, they go there and they own the course. So you got some guys that could play some ball. So our, our team went in there and they said this. They said, if we win, we get to pray for you. Deal? And, and, and they were supernaturally empowered. I just talked to Gabriel. He said they, they took over the court five games straight, prayed for five teams. There was a crowd of 60 people watching, and this is what ended up happening because they're seeing everybody with the Jesus shirts winning. They're saying, you guys are YouTubers. You're playing us, huh? They go, we're not YouTubers. We're just Christians. We're just, we're just hacking you in Jesus' name. We're just in, dunking on you in Jesus' name. They go, nah, you guys are D1 basketball players. No, we're not. But all I know is that we were supernatural winning in Jesus' name. Jesus is still playing basketball and praying for people on the streets. He does it through me and you. How many understand that you have a purpose? And if you're part of the church, get ready for God to begin to use you like he's never used you. You belong to me. You're powerful. Go out there and do it. The body of Jesus is still doing it. And the last thing Jesus said, Jesus said, that all the forces of hell cannot stop my church from carrying out my mission of saving souls on earth. This is what we're telling the devil. You cannot stop this because you did not create this. And what God has created and what God has built is more powerful than any resistance that you have. It's time for you to get your identity back. Well, God is saying, I've already disarmed the enemy. I've put you in a position with my authority, and I've given you power to go in anywhere you need to go and take over and conquer the atmosphere, save souls, and set people free. Now, when I read the scripture that the gates of hell will not overpower it, if you've read that scripture before, you're like, what does that mean? And this is what I found out. The gates of hell... In, in, in the Greek, when you look it up in the Greek, this is what it means. It means a great prison. So what he's saying, I go, God, what does that mean? He goes, everybody that doesn't know me is in a spiritual prison. And they can't get out. Because it's a demonic prison. And unless we rescue them, they stay in the prison. Some of us today in this room, you're in a prison of fear, depression. It seems like you get the same exact thing keeps happening over and over. Alcoholism, rejection, destructive relationships. And you say, I don't want to do that again. But you find yourself doing it again. And you're beginning to beat yourself up because you can't change. You've promised your wife, you've promised your kids, you've promised your friends. I promise you, I'm so sorry what I did. I won't do it again. 
But this is a problem. You need to get set free from the prison you're in. Understand this. We, many of us were born in a prison. And the reason I say that, because you were passed on a lifestyle from your mom and your dad that put you in a prison from the beginning. Some of them weren't there or they were abusive. They didn't have God in their lives. And they passed on their chains. They didn't pass on their victories to you. But I got good news. The God has set up a church. And his church is so powerful that no matter what prison you're in, God has said that the enemy, the devil, the prison, the fortress that you've been in cannot resist or overpower the team, the church that's going to go in and rescue you. Have you ever seen a prison break? Well, God is saying, I've I've created my church to be so strong that it could go into any prison and set people free. Come on, there's prisons in Pomona. There's prisons in your home. And what the enemy, what God is saying, it doesn't matter what resistance is there. I've created a church that can overpower it. And the devil cannot stop this. We're going to go in. We're going to go into Uganda. And we're going to set people free. We're going into Carson and Compton and Venice Beach and Long Beach. This week, we got a truck that we're using and it has a stage. We're crazy. We invade. And we're going to Hoover Street in L.A. Come on. We're, come on, where the Crips are. We're going to go right there. We're dropping the truck. And we're going to start proclaiming that. Come on, proclaiming Jesus. And people, come on, gangsters are going to get saved this week. We're going to Long Beach. We're going to prisons this week. We're going to Pomona this week. We're hitting the streets this week. And in, 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 in August, we're going to, to Uganda. We're going so many places. I don't even know where we're going. I remember I told you guys this before. That the, when, you, when you come with the church, I, I want you to know this. Stop magnifying the devil and start magnifying the power you have. Some of you guys are scared of the devil. I don't want to say nothing. He might get me. No, we're the ones that are picking on him. We're the ones that say, get out of here. We're the ones saying, darkness, leave right now. Leave my kids. Leave my family. Leave my marriage. This is going to be broken once and for all. Is there anybody here that realizes we're the church, the strongest force on earth? I love it. Power. We could go anywhere and take over. Do you remember I told you guys that thing last week when I went to, when I went to Las Vegas? I said, Pastor, what are you doing in Las Vegas? What are we doing in Las Vegas? Stays. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. That was my family, just kicking back. Someone gave us, someone gave us a, 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 a hotel there for my family. We hung out there, and that's what we did. But the night that I got there, a demon over Las Vegas visited me. And, and he visited me. This was the words he told me. He goes, what are you doing here? Because he realized that there was a church member there. And he realized that the church member that was there and the leader that was there knew his power and authority. See, I want you to understand that the demons over Las Vegas are scared of you. The demons over, come on, your situation are scared of you. You've got to stop being scared of the enemy. God's giving you power over every enemy that you're facing. And the demon already knew that the one that's coming in, he just crossed the borders, can change the city, can change Las Vegas. And what I'm telling you, the same God that's in me is the same God that's in you. And the Bible says, greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. It's time to use the authority that God has given us and be the church. God did not save you to remain a prisoner. We're rescuers. We're on a rescue mission. Look what the Bible says here. It's interesting. Jude 23. Rescue those who are living in the dangers of hell. Hell's fire. There's people right now that are living a hellish life. They're living in it, and they can't get out. And God says, I'm calling you to go rescue them. But look what the scripture says. There are others you should treat with mercy, but be careful that their filthy lives don't rub off on you. Now, this is all it's saying, is that when you're reaching someone that's hurting and broken and lost, and living a life that's unclean, 
be careful that while you're doing that, you don't become like them. We got to be careful to think that you're a believer and you think you're going to reach them being like them. Well, I'm just smoking weed so we could just, you know, kick back and have some common ground. Be all things to all people. <laughs> or think that you could, I'm reaching my boyfriend right now. What I do is have sex with him. And, but he says if I do, he'll come to church. Right. You're not going to reach him that way. You're going to reach him that way. You're gonna, you know how you're going to reach him? When you realize I'm the church. And God has called me to be like, come on, like to be like Jesus. And I'm going to tell you this, no matter what lifestyle that you're in, whatever you're struggling with, God can make you into a brand new poor person. That's what we call being born again. People need to see, come on, they need to see the DNA of Jesus in you. They need to see the lifestyle of Jesus in you. They need to see the holiness of Jesus. That means I'm separated from God. I know this is, this is not even common nowadays that we talk about this because we are so worldly in the church that we want church to be a, a motivational talk. This is not a motivational talk. We're in a real war for souls. And this is about, come on, about being submitted to God so you can resist some devils and allow God to change your life so you can be in a position to help them. Amen. We could do it. We're going places. How many ready to go to Uganda with me? Wait, wait, wait. Are people dying over there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We might not come back. <laughs> All I'm saying, we're going to go over there. We'll come back. But what I'm saying is, you have to understand, we love them so much that we put our lives on the line. And, and this is, re come on, this is real Jesus walk. No, you, no one has greater love for another than to lay down their life. See, we want to do great work, but we want to do it and stay, stay comfortable. And God says, come on, get out of your comfort zone, sacrifice your life, go out there, reach somebody because you're the church. Don't get intimidated. Go out there and take over. So what happens in a church? Why is a church so important? The church is a place where souls are saved and people receive eternal life. The church is a place where the Lord is worshipped and people experience it and have encounters with the presence and the power of God. The church is God's army that carries out his mission and expands his kingdom on earth. The church is a place where families and marriages and relationships are restored. The church is a place where those who are addicted and oppressed can come to be set free. The church is where the homeless and destitute can come and, we, and be provided a home to live in. The church is a place where our children and teens are trained and taught to live for God and find their God. God-given purpose and discover their true identity in Christ. The church is a place where those who have broken hearts can come to be healed. The church rescues and takes care of the orphans of the world. God uses his church to reach and transform people, homes, and cities. The poor and the hungry are fed in his church. Prisoners are visited and ministered to by his church. The word is taught and people are spiritually fed the word of God in the church. People are discipled and trained to make disciples in the church. The sick are healed in the church. Hope is found in the church. People are loved and cared for in the church. God's people discover their spiritual gifts and serve one another in his church. Miracles happen in the church. God's vision for the earth is accomplished through his church. The enemy is resisted, defeated, and removed by the authority that God has given his church. Demons are cast out and people are set free through his church. The lonely find a loving family in the church. People receive eternal life and new beginnings in his church. Give God some praise. That's what happens here. Nowhere else does that happen but here. I'm telling you. I'm giving your identity back. Come on, I'm giving your, come on, you're not a victim. God is putting you in a position to overcome anything that's out there. You have the authority and the power of God. We can do it. Si se puede. We're going to give some testimonies right now real quick. And this is just a tip of the iceberg of what God's doing in this church. But I want to show you what happens in the church. Let's hear some testimonies. All right. This is Kamiko. Kamiko's in our women's home. 
Give it for Kamiko. So Kamiko, tell us what your life was like before coming to church. Before coming to church, I spent 18 years in the California State Penitentiary for Women, and I came out and I was put back into the neighborhood I was in before. I was introduced also to Jesus while I was in prison. However, when I came back to the neighborhood, it was still we, alcohol, the gang banging, and I just started partaking in the marijuana use again. It started to overcome and take over my life. One day I just asked the Lord, please help me. I can't live like this anymore. I know that this is not what you called me for. So like maybe two minutes later, an ex coworker called and was like, how are you doing? What's going on? And, I, and she was like, you want to do something? I said, yes, I want to go to church. So the next thing I know, she came, she picked me up and took me to the way in LA. Awesome. So what happened at the Way LA? In the Way in LA, I started going to church three times a week because they also had one in Compton, California. Um, I was starting the Discipleship Holy Warriors class, and next thing I knew, who I was living with no longer wanted me to live there and said I needed to leave. So Pastor Gabriel and his wife um, said that, you know, we have a woman's home in San Bernardino. I've never been here before. I said, okay, Lord, I'll go. And I just picked up everything and I came. Awesome. What's Jesus been doing in your life since then? Since then, he has given me this voice because as you can see, I'm standing up here talking in front of you guys. Um, and I have courage to speak the word of God. Um, Satan, I no longer work for him. I work for Jesus. And I'm here to totally annihilate the enemy. Come on. Jesus sets the captives free. Understand, she was a prisoner before she went to prison. She got out and she went back into the prison. And then she came to Jesus and he set her free from the prison for life. If we didn't go to L.A., come on, if we didn't go to L.A. in a rescue mission, she wouldn't be right now. Yeah. But there's been a team that's invading L.A., and they went to reach her, and now she's here, saved, free, and giving a testimony yeah. before thousands of people. Yeah. How many know that God can change a life in a moment if he's just given an opportunity yeah. through the church? Yeah. Let's hear this. And this is good. All right, this is Brandon. Excited. Brandon's in our men's home. Say hi to Brandon, everybody. So, Brandon, uh, tell us what your life was like before you came to the church. All right. First, before I start, I want to give thanks to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And give thanks to Pastor Marcos for stepping in and doing the vision he had. had because if, it wasn't, if he didn't step up, I wouldn't be here. And I'm just proud to be up here. But I was out there homeless uh, and on drugs right here behind this McDonald's, this uh, IHOP uh, up there on that hill. And that was like 10 months ago. I was assaulted. I got hit in the head with a machete and stabbed in the side. And it, you know, it took a lot. But uh, I made it down that hill because God saved me because there uh, wasn't nobody else up there. But God, and he had, and Jesus he, he gave me enough strength to make it down that hill. I passed out probably about six, seven times because it took me like, I think, six to eight hours to get down that hill. And uh, someone seen me passed out in front of Wobble Grill one night. And uh, that's when the uh, MLMs came and got me. And while I was in the hospital, I was, I got, someone was telling me more and more about the way. And like I heard about it, and I knew it was somewhere around here because uh, the farthest I made it was right here to the post office. I, I tried to come a couple of times, but I just, something kept blocking me. And I, I made it about three or four times before in the past years, but never, all I had to do was come one more building over. But I couldn't, I don't know why. But anyway, uh, when I came into this, after I got to the hospital and I came here, I remember it was a Sunday like this, but I got here late, about 3.34, and uh, Sister Jenna in the women's home, she had introduced, you know, asked me what did I want it, and I was like, I don't know. 
uh, I just heard, just walk through these doors and I would be, you know, I get help. But uh, I didn't even know what to expect. So when I came in, she took me to some teenage students and the students took me to Pastor Janet. And then Pastor Janet took me to Larry. And so this was, you know, it's been going, you know, like a, it just kept going on and on, passing me over. But then uh, they was telling me to, to come back Tuesday. And I was like, no, I can't. I don't, it took so long to get here. It took everything I had to get here. I don't think, it, I know for a fact, if I go out them doors, I'm not coming back. So they was like, well, uh, Larry was saying, well, what you want me to do? I can't do nothing until Tuesday. <laughs> so I looked at him and I, then I walked over there to them chairs. I was like, I'm gonna sit here until Tuesday. <laughs> and so, <laughs> hey. All right, Brandon. So, even before that, now, Brandon, were you a drug user your whole life, or when did you start using? I was 33 years old when I first started using drugs. I was, I was living all right, living good, I thought, you know, because I wasn't you know, on drugs. Uh, I was you no, know, I'll take that back. I used to drink a lot, but I didn't do no drugs. But then when I, when I was 33, the first time I started using it, and, I lost my family. I lost everything. I lost my identity. I lost, you know, my purpose. I didn't, I didn't, you know, I was compared to a, a hood ornament on a car, you know, for no purpose. You know, it's just there. And I remember an old lady said that one time, and I was like, that hit me hard, like a hood ornament. That, that's crazy. That, uh, that don't have no purpose. What is a hood ornament? And I felt disrespected. So I was like, I tried to change, but God, God had better plan. Yeah. So with this moment you came, you, you sat on those chairs, you got into the home that day. And what has Jesus done in your life since then? First of all, you can't nobody tell me that Jesus can't do it. <laughs> That's what you can't tell me, not me. Because uh, how I am... What he done for me in my life so far, first, he saved me physically. Then he saved me spiritually. He, he, brought, he brought my family. This last Sunday just passed. My kids was here on Father's Day. That, that, that was a good Father's Day, but he wasn't done. He, he <laughs> my daughter... She looked over, she was sitting like two seats over from me. She looked over like, Dad, would you go up there with me? Man, now that's a Father's Day present. Come on, let's give God some praise. Come on, Come on can you learn something from this story? This, I, I'm telling you, some of you got to, this is, this is a lesson. Come back on Tuesday, say, well, I'll sit here until Tuesday. You know what that means? You got to want your breakthrough bad enough that it doesn't matter what obstacles are there. I'm not going to get offended out of my miracle. I am staying here until I get there, my breakthrough. Is there anybody here that's hungry for a breakthrough and you're willing to fight for it? I love it. Let's all stand up. You guys are awesome. And we're going to dismiss in just a second. But no one leave until I, I dismiss. Because I want to make sure that we don't mess up, like, miss this moment here because it's a moment of decision and God always takes us to a moment of action. This next week, um, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I know where you're supposed to be. I'm going to be here. Let's be here in the house of God. If you have actually, I want you to get this. There's been things that you've done and some of you have got on, got on, some, on some crazy runs and you come back and you're 20 pounds lighter. Why wouldn't you do a run for Jesus? I guarantee you're going to be 20 times stronger. Come on, wiser. Come to, come to church. I guarantee it's going to be awesome. Starting Wednesday, one day at a time. It's going to be good. Um, but also what we're doing next week is I, I'm asking you, I need your help. We're, we need the down payment for the building in like two weeks on January 3rd. Um, and ask God, to, just ask God, what should I bring so we could open that church up and understand these buildings. We want to open them up. And, and, and don't get offended by this, but I want you to understand, we can't do it without down payment. 
It's just the way it is. We need to get in that building. What happens? You're saying, God touched me. I want to touch somebody else's life. And you're just passing on. If someone's invested in you, that's why there's seats here. There, I mean, there's a mic here. There's sound here. There's a children's ministry. They invested for you. And now we're going to invest it. I'll come on, pass it on to somebody else. And just think about, ask God, what do you give? And, and to give with a generous heart, that's next week. So we got a few things that we're doing. The last thing that we're going to be doing is, I don't even know where this business card is, but you should have got a, a card that says um, it's going to be okay. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to pass out 50,000 of them. And it'd be great to pass them out this week. We want to bombard our city with hope. And this is such a cool thing. It just says, it's going to be okay. Uh, someone yesterday got the cars and they gave it to someone on the streets. And when they gave it to him, he just started crying. He was going through the toughest time of his life. He was arguing with his wife on the phone. And when he got it, he was arguing with his wife on the phone. When he read it, he just started crying and bawling. And then he read the back and he started crying more. And then his wife started crying. And their relationship was, it was being restored off a card. And someone said, what'd you, they asked him, what would you say? I, go, I didn't say nothing. He gave him a card. He read it. This is what I want you to do also is, is put, it on, put it on like when you go to Costco, go get, go get your food or whatever you get and then come out and just start putting it on cars. Just like boom, 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 boom. That's it. Let God use the car. That's it. I go to CVS. I just give it or I just go to the waitress. I go, here, just read this. It's going to be okay. How many know that's a really good message? How many would like to give out 50,000 of this? So just get your 25 and give it out this week. It'd be awesome to give it out before Wednesday. Just find a place, give them out. It'd be great. I want to give an opportunity. This is the last. I want to give an opportunity for every single person here to enter into a relationship with Jesus. Now, all God wants is a relationship with you. The Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know what that means? That God wants to live in you. And we say, well, what is God? God is love. Every one of us is looking for love, but there's nothing like the love of God. It's accepting, it's loving, it's forgiving, and it's powerful. It's healing, it's affirming. There's nothing like God's love. I remember one night I was um, in a real big trial with my daughter that got cancer. And it was right, my friend, she had cancer and I didn't know she had cancer, but she was four, three years old, and I just came from vacation. She had a lump underneath her arm, and she couldn't walk anymore. So we got off the plane. The next day, we're going to Loma Linda to check her out. And I remember that night, the peace of God visited me in a dream, and I felt peace and love like I've never, ever experienced. And I remember going to work. And I'm talking about non-believers. And man, last night was amazing. I got a peace that I've experienced that's so fulfilling I've never experienced. That was before we went to the doctors and I got the report. All I'm saying, there's a peace and a love that's so satisfying that you can't get from nothing but Jesus. And I know you're searching, but you're searching for Jesus. You're here in this room, and Jesus says, I stand at the door of your heart, and I'm knocking. And all he's saying, will you let me in? And if he comes in, you know what he's going to do? Forgive you, set you free, heal you, and fill you with his power and his presence, make you a new person, give you new desires, new levels of power and ability. He's going to begin to direct your life. He goes, I don't want you to be alone. I want a relationship with you. That's all God wants. And those that have a relationship with the Lord by accepting Jesus have the gift of eternal life. Just remember this. One day you're going to breathe your last breath on this earth and you're going into eternity. There's only two locations. You're going to be with the Lord in heaven forever and ever and ever because you place your faith in Jesus Christ. He forgave you and you received the gift of eternal life. Or you're going to reject Jesus and say, not now. And then when you die, the relationship that you don't have is a relationship you won't have for eternity. Not only will you be missing it here and you'll be depressed here and you're going to be in a cycle of weariness and begin to have sleepless nights and think you're going to be in a cycle. You're going to wonder, when, when is life going to get better? And the truth is, it's not going to get better 
without the Lord. You need to get set free from the prison. But there's only one name to call on to be saved and be set free. And there's a scripture, Jesus said it, who the son sets free is free indeed. Today's your day to be free from your past, be free from your addictions, be free. Come on, free from the prison you're in. You know the prison you're in. Whoever calls on Jesus is saved. So I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to count to three. And I'm just, it's not a magic number, but it's just a point of a decision. And when I say three, if you're a believer and you need to, you know, you've walked away from God. It's time for you to come back and get on fire. You, you, I've been playing. God says, come back, son. I'm not going to condemn you. I'm going to welcome you. I can't wait for you to come back. Don't be ashamed. Don't try to fix yourself and come to God. Just come to God and let him fix you. Today's it. Or you're, you're in this room and you need a touch of God. You need to get set free. And you're not sure if you're to die right now, you'd go to heaven. Don't play Russian roulette with your future because you never know. There's people, that ha this happens all the time. They leave this church and happens all the time. Within a week, they're dead. And they didn't know that God was reaching them and it was their last opportunity. And he was knocking their heart's door. And you're thinking tomorrow. That voice that says tomorrow or not now is the devil. He's trying to keep you in the prison, and Jesus has come to rescue you. So if you're saying, Pastor, I don't know if I'm saved, but I want to get saved, or I'm a Christian, I need to come back home, or you need to get set free from something, give your life to Jesus. You're hopeless. Come on, give your life to Jesus. When I say three, you're going to raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. Jesus is not ashamed of you. I'm not even going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, because if you're ashamed of God here, how are you going to serve God out there? Don't be ashamed. Jesus is not ashamed of you. He died publicly for you because he loves you. Today's your day to stand up. I'm living for Jesus. Come the way you are. Don't fix your life. Just come the way you are. He'll fix it. Come the way you are. When I count to three, you say, I want to recommit my life. I want to give my life to Jesus. I need a new beginning. I need a new start. I want Jesus to set me free. Raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hands all over this building. I see all those hands. See all those hands. Proud of you, babies. Proud of you. Proud of you. Proud of you. Come on. Give your life to Jesus. Come, come on. Give your life to Jesus. Come on. Give your life. I want those to raise their hands. Could you do me more of a favor? Can you give me the honor privilege to pray with you? Everyone online, if you raise your hand there, come on, get ready. We're going to pray with you too. Because God, come on, he's everywhere at once. Come on, let's, as they're coming forward, let's give them a hand. If you raise your hand, come forward. If you raise your hand, come forward. That's your next step. You're walking out of your old life into a new life. There has to be an action. Come on, take your step. Ask your neighbor. You want to go up there, I'll go up there with you. Come on, let's give God some praise. They're still coming. Heaven celebrating. One more time, one more time. Let's give him a hand. Come on. Heaven celebrated. Someone's going to set free. This someone's daughter. This someone's mama. This someone's father. Come on. Someone's been praying for them. This is their moment of freedom. In the name of Jesus. Come on. They're still coming. In the name of Jesus. Come on. The revival's beginning right now. In the name of Jesus. Wednesday night's going to continue. You want to keep it going. All right, we're going to pray. I want to make sure we have enough people here to pray. Okay, I'm proud of every one of you. Some of you have come up today, and I guarantee you this. If someone would have told you, you're going up there at the beginning of the service, you say, I'm not. And you're thinking, man, I never hear God. I know you've heard God today. Because if you didn't hear God, there's no way you would have walked out of those seats and come here. God is speaking to you, and he loves you. You have to be done with your old life, so I'm done. You got to be done doing it your way and say, God, I need direction. And remember, God is never condemning you, putting you down. He's here to lift you up. Today's your day of freedom. Okay? It doesn't matter how messed up and how many broken pieces you came up with here today. God knows how to put it back together. That's what he does. That's awesome. And the more you live for him, the more whole you're going to be. Follow him. You followed everything else. Follow Jesus. Some of you need to. Un some of you guys need to unfollow some stuff you've been following. Unfollow some people you've been following because they're taking you to destruction. It's time to be done. Are you ready? We're gonna pray, and you're gonna give your life to Jesus. And then we have a class called Starting at the Way. And here's the book. It's an amazing book. Next every Sunday at nine o'clock, we have a class. You're going to be here Wednesday. You're going to be here Thursday. You, I mean, you're going to start, you're going to start a Holy Ghost party lifestyle. 
you're going to be here partying and sometimes coming to the after party right here in the front. Like, ah, let's go. Come on. Be about Jesus like you were about those crazy stuff out there. Be about Jesus. Let's do it. So we got a book for you, and you could get this book. And it, it, it's amazing because I, I set it up in this book so I could teach you scripture. And then I wrote the commentary to explain it to you. Because I want, I wish I could be with you in your home and like, shh, this is what it means. This is what it means. So I wrote what it means. So when you're studying it, you're going to understand. Say, well, that was easy. I get it. I want to be with you, but I, I can't be everywhere once. Jesus can do that. But I got the book to help you with that. So I'll say next week is starting at the way, okay? Church, let's not be an in and out church. We're a revival church. And when you're a revival church, come on, we pray for the people. We take care of them. Come on, we don't, we're not in and out burger. Mom, this is people's lives. Come on, people's futures right here. Let's pray together, okay? Men, I'm proud of you. It takes a real man to live for God. Ladies, I'm so proud of you. God's setting you free. Okay? And we're your family. And I'm going to tell you this, I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to be here in San Bernardino until Jesus comes back. So if you say, Pastor, where you're at, you know where to find me. Right? I love you guys. And we're going to do this together. And I'm excited to build a relationship with you. But keep taking the next step. Understand this. You'll never go to the next, next level if you're not willing to sacrifice your last level. That means you're going to have to be willing to do what you've never done to start getting results you've always wanted. Push. Let's pray, all right? Come every Sunday to church. Come Wednesday. Join the class. It's going to be amazing. It'll change your life. Let's pray. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. And we're going to pray together. I'm going to help you with this prayer. You're giving your life to Jesus right now. Say, say, Jesus, I thank you for loving me so much that you died on the cross and you suffered to pay the price for the wrong I've done. Set me free from all addiction, bad habits, depression, fear. Thank you, Jesus, for setting me free from every prison that I've been in. Today, I claim my freedom. Your word says, who you set free is really free. And devil, get out of my life. I'm serving Jesus from this point forward. I open my heart and ask you, Jesus, come in and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Today, I receive the gift of the eternal life. I'm saved right now. I have eternal life right now. I'm a new person right now. I'm forgiven right now. There's a brand new start right now. And from this day forward, I follow Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We love you. God bless you. Need prayer? Even if you're sick or something, come forward. We want to pray. Miracles are going to happen here. Miracles happens in the church. We want to pray with you. Make sure we get you the information. You're going to get that book, 9 o'clock next Sunday. I want to make sure we got coverage. I need the leaders to go through and make sure everybody's covered here.